All right, welcome everybody. Uh, we are about to start here. My name is Nick Opterbeck. I'm with Answer Lab, and uh, today I'd like to welcome you to our webinar, Measure Your Website Experience. For those of you that are not familiar with Answer Lab, uh, we want to provide you with a little bit of context for this presentation. Answer Lab is a user experience research firm headquartered here in San Francisco, also with offices in New York. As you can see from this slide here, we have the privilege of working with many industry-leading companies, helping them to shape their digital strategy. Today we're going to be talking about measuring your website experience, what is important, why it's important, and how it's done. Your speaker today is going to be Sally Cohen. Sally is a user experience manager here at Answer Lab and has broad expertise in both quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, she has overseen literally hundreds of studies across numerous methods and markets, and her work has been cited in the Wall Street Journal, ZDNet, Reuters, Fortune, and she's even appeared on CBNBC. Now, during the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat box located on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, we'll be sure to address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, everybody that is attending today uh, will also receive a follow-up email with a best practices document um, summarizing the presentation for your review after the fact. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sally now. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, all the folks on the phone, for joining the call today. For those of you on the East Coast, I hope you are braving the heat. Um, for the purposes of the call today, we're going to go through four key points. First, we're going to talk about what is measurement. The whole uh, topic of this webinar is really about measuring your website user experience. So we're going to talk at a, at a very high level about the definition of measurement, what it is that we're here to talk about. Then we're going to talk about why even bother? What's the point of measuring your website user experience? I'll give you some, some really key points to help drive that home. And then we're going to talk through how to actually perform a measurement, how to measure your website user experience, some things that we've learned over the years conducting several of these types of studies um, and some of our best practices. And then we're going to talk through what this actually looks like in practice. We're going to talk through three key case studies that uh, deal with measuring the website user experience. Before we move on, I just want to reiterate something Nick said, which is that if you have questions throughout the course of the presentation today, please feel free to chat them into the chat box. Um, I can try and pick them up as we go, and if nothing else, we will get to them at the very end of our conversation. Okay. So diving right in, we're going to talk about defining measurement. Again, the whole purpose of this call is to talk about measuring your website user experience, but what do we mean by measurement? And we're going to start at a very high level with business questions. We all have business questions that we need to answer, that we need to talk to our boss about, or we need to talk to management or executives about. And they can be things like, how well am I doing? How is my website user experience doing compared with the past or my competition or with a particular standard in my industry? Or maybe it's about uh, my customers. Have my customers changed their habits or their behaviors? And if so, by how much? What's changed about their habits and behaviors and opinions and, and by how much? We may also want to know how the newest version of my website is performing. Is it more successful than the past version? And by how much? How much more successful? Can, for example, can my customers um, navigate better on my new website? Or does it help or hurt the brand impression that my customers get when they visit our website? And how does that compare to a previous version? We also might be wondering how, my, how our site user experiences, how my site user experience differs by audience type. So maybe you have several different types of visitors coming to your website. How do their experiences differ across those different user types? And then finally, again, just another example, you might be wondering what is the impact of my brand or messaging campaign on the user experience? So um, stimuli that users encounter outside of their site experience may have an impact on how they view your website, how they view your brand or your messaging when they come to your website. So how do those things play together? So these are all kinds of high-level examples of high-level business questions that we might have. We might get asked by our boss or our, our management team. And these all tie to one key point, which is goals. We all have goals. And we're trying to define our goals. So maybe it's improving our website user experience, improving our brand or, or messaging in the marketplace, et cetera. And oftentimes these goals pertain to things like th things related to change like change, lift, impact. How can we improve? How can we drive things forward? How can we, how can we induce change 
um, that has something to do with our business through our website. Um, so what does all this have to do with your website and measuring your user experience? Well, to take it, roll it back a little bit, we have the product life cycle. And the product life cycle, as we see here in very, very uh, broad strokes, we have discovery, optimization, and validation, which is truly a cycle that goes all the way around several times, possibly. Um, it's kind of like a map. And we're actually going to use the analogy of a map to talk uh, through our conversation today. So the purpose here is thinking about evolving or changing your site over time as you move through the phases of the product life cycle, all with the aim of answering some of those business questions and achieving some of those business goals. And one key feature of a map are mile markers. Um, we need mile markers on the map or on a road trip as reference points to help us understand where we are on our trip on the map, where we're going, how far we've come. And these reference points are just as important in the product development lifecycle map to understand where our UX is today, where we want to take our user experience in the future, where our user experience has been, and how we stack up against ourselves and other things that are going on around us, like our competitors or our customers' expectations. The reference point really helps us understand, again, where we are, where we've come from, and where we're going. So when we talk about measurement of our website user experience, we're really talking about trying to understand just that. Again, where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. Okay, so now we're going to move into the next stage of our conversation today, which is really maybe one of the most important parts of our, our talk. And that's really about why we should even bother measuring our website user experience in the first place. I'm going to tell you all about how to do it and what it looks like in practice. But first, I think I probably should convince you why you should even bother. And one question for you as we get started here, which is how do you know that your user experience is headed in the right direction to achieve those goals and answer those business questions that we just talked about? Do you know if your user experience is on the path that you want it to be on? Do you know that you're following the directions like your GPS says that you should? Or do you need to recalculate, maybe make a U-turn, go back, change some things so that you can achieve those goals? So to follow up, some subsequent questions for you that relate. The first is thinking about, again, this analogy of a map, first and foremost, do you know where your user experience is today? Can you plot your user experience on a map? Secondly, do you know where your competitors are popping up? Where are their user experiences today? How do they compare to where yours is? And then finally, where do you want your user experience to be in six months or a year or two years from now? How do you know how to get there? How do you know if getting there is going to be an improvement or a degradation over where you were for your users? And how do you know if it's going to be an improvement or a degradation for your users vis-a-vis -vis what's going on with your competitor set? And all of this is bearing in mind the fact that the technology landscape is constantly changing and your users' expectations will change over time, along with the changes that you're making to your website. So again, taking the map back to the product life cycle analogy, you want to move your UX based on your goals from point A to point B. So how do you go about getting it there? How do you trace that map? How do you, um, how do you move along the product life cycle? You have to figure out your direction. You have to plan out your road trip. And as you do this, as you move your UX from point A to point B, you might pass some landmarks. And we have some great example landmarks here for you. Um, so you might pass some really kitschy giant tire on the road from the Detroit airport into Detroit. Or you might pass a huge elephant on the New Jersey coast. Or maybe it's Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox in Minnesota. But the point of me showing all of all of you these um, kind of strange and kitschy photos is 
to give you the analogy that these landmarks are the sort of major stopping off points, the pit stops, if you will, um, on your product lifecycle roadmap. They could be things like a major site redesign, a complete overhaul of your website. Maybe they are some tweaks to your information architecture or starting from scratch with your information architecture. Maybe you're just tweaking the look and feel or even changing uh, relatively smaller things like some imagery, imagery or some nomenclature. They also might be external things, landmarks that are coming from external sources, things like changes in your competitive set. So maybe you have a competitor who's really up to the ante of their user experience. They've really um, pushed the envelope and driven it forward. Or maybe you have a new emerging competitor that you hadn't even thought of before. Maybe the whole landscape of your competitive set is changing. So these landmarks that you would see on the point on the road from taking your UX from your UX from point A to point B are really those big key moments that impact how your users react to and view your user experience. So thinking about these different landmarks, how do you know whether or not they have um, created a positive improvement, created a positive movement in the way that your users respond to your user experience? or not? Um, have they made your, if, if they're a site redesign or a nomenclature or an IA overhaul, have they made your site easier to use or more appealing for your users? Um, have they made your users more likely to go out and take action based on your website, more likely to potentially make a purchase if you're an e-commerce website? How do you know that they're helping you realize those business goals and create the change that we talked about at the very top of this presentation? And that all ties into um, the idea that measuring really helps you to set your course towards those goals, to plot that course from point A to point B, and drive your UX forward, and ensure that those landmarks are having the kind of impact that you hoped for, the positive impacts that you'd hoped for. It's really, measuring is really like a compass, um, and if you're not on the right course, if you find through measurement that you're not driving or steering your user experience in the direction that you'd hoped, Having those measurements helps you step back and write your course, helps you put your user experience back on course to achieve your goals. So we have this compass here, but I actually think that the next um, image is more indicative. So this is obviously some funny data that we have um, put up here for you that's very, very visual appealing, but it gives you this idea that if you're measuring, in this case, against your competitors, and you have a specific goal in mind where you'd like your UX to be, you can see how you compared to your competitors, how you've compared to yourself over time, and also the impact of any major landmarks on your roadmap. So in this case, an example would be a site redesign. And if, this, if your UX isn't achieving your goal, it isn't heading in the right or trending in the right direction, having this measurement allows you to gauge that and then to step back and say, okay, what can I do about it? So again, why measure your website user experience? Because you need to develop a reference point that will help you understand the change that we talked about earlier, the delta. You need to have a starting point and then reference points potentially over time to help you steer that course from point A to point B, where point B is really achieving the business goals. It's going to help you make confidence decisions about the website changes that you are going to make going forward, and it helps you to understand um, how your site compares against competitors, if that's something that you're interested in. All right, so hopefully I have convinced you why measuring your website user experience is important. The next portion of our talk is really around how to measure, how to uh, perform measurement, and we are going to focus for the purposes of this conversation on one key way that we find really useful here at Answer Lab, which is benchmarking. And since today in 2012 we don't really carry around um, paper dictionaries, we consulted the oracle that is Google to get a, de a definition of benchmarking. And as you can see from this slightly larger um, blow up of the definition, the verb benchmark is it means to evaluate or check something by comparison with a standard. And that standard can be anything from um, your standards that you've set within your company 
It could be a standard within your industry that's industry-wide and across companies. It could be against another company. The standard could be your competitor. Um, so there are lots of options here. And in fact, it's great because we have a lot of tools at our disposal to accomplish benchmarking. We can use both qualitative or quantitative methods. We can conduct benchmarking in person or remotely. So what that means is sitting there with the user or in different locations from the user. And similarly, we can conduct benchmarking through moderated and unmoderated means. And to give you a better sense of what this means, we have a little chart with four key methods for measurement, in this case, four key methods for benchmarking. And um, we're going to start on the outsides of this chart, looking at in-lab benchmarking, which is a key qualitative method. It's something that um, a, a lot of you may have encountered in the past. This is a, had been a very popular method for benchmarking for a long time, where you bring users into the lab, you watch them conduct tasks on a website, um, you might code their errors, their actions, their time on task, et cetera. And it's really great for a couple of key reasons. One is that you get to observe those, these users as they're interacting with your website in real time. And the second is that it gives you the ability to ask follow-up questions. So the user completes a task, maybe they struggle with it, and after they've completed the task, you can go and ask them, you know, what, what did you feel, how did you feel about that task? What did you feel or what did you think about um, what was, what was problematic for you, and potentially ask them their input for how to improve it. But there are some key drawbacks with in-lab benchmarking, and really it's around the, these are around the fact that the users aren't in their natural environment. They are completing these tasks in a lab environment. And also, these studies tend to have smaller sample sizes. The reason for that is a larger sample size uh, requires a lot more time to ensure that you can get people into the lab and completing tasks at a high rate, um, and also can be a little bit uh, on the costly side as well. The other method um, on the other far side, on the right side of this chart, is site analytics. And this is, again, something that many of you must, might be familiar with, and that's because it's, it's quite prevalent in our industry. Um, and it's really a quantitative measure, aggregated site feedback, so aggregated feedback coming through your website for click-throughs or A-B a -B testing data or um, search engine optimization information. Um, and the great part about this is you can passively collect a large amount of information. But the key drawback here is, in contrast to the in-lab benchmarking method, the clicks and the information that you get from site analytics are out of context to the user feedback. So you get all the data, but you don't really know what's happening. And that brings me to the two methods in the middle of this chart, which are in blue. And these are two methods for measurement that we really like here at Answer Lab because they have some really unique benefits. Um, they do have their own respective drawbacks, and we can talk through those as well, but um, intercept surveys are fantastic because we get um, quantitative data, oftentimes in large sample sizes, from users directly. And these are surveys where we collect visitor feedback and also possibly their behavior as they use the site. So it kind of blends the best of both worlds from the in-lab benchmarking and the site analytics where we get their click streams and their, their behavioral data. Um, but also their feedback and their reactions. And one key benefit to the Intercept study is the fact that we get actual site traffic who are coming to your website from their natural environment, whether that's their home or their office or their um, library. And we can understand their reasons for site visit. Because we're talking to them as they come to your website, we can drill down into why they're there. And the other key method that I wanted to uh, spend some time talking about is an email survey. Much like the intercept survey, it's great because we can gather both user feedback and their behavior. And these are surveys that are emailed out to a targeted group of users. And the key benefit of this method is that we can get their feedback on competitive websites. We can actually send users to visit your website as well as websites of your key competitors so we can gauge how your UX compares to your competitive set. And again, these users are providing feedback in their natural environment. The trade-off for the email survey is that while it is a targeted sample and we can very, um, very clearly and easily define who we might want to go after with these email invitations, it's not your actual site traffic. So you won't be able to understand their reasons for visiting your site because they've been directed to your site. That would be their key reason. 
So those are the key methods. And again, the intercept survey and the email survey are two methods we like a lot at AnswerLab for their blending of the user feedback and also the behavioral information. And we're going to talk a little bit about behavioral information because getting metrics around your website user experience is really fantastic. You can see how things are changing, how they are, how users are responding to different landmarks on your product lifecycle roadmap, like a site redesign. And you can see in this case, um, again, just an example, that the ability to find desired information after the site redesign went up, which is great. Maybe that's your goal. But it's hard to understand exactly why this is happening. What's going on with your users um, that, this, that these metrics are moving? And one key way that we found really useful in AnswerLab is to collect users' behavior to get an explanation. Again, this is just an example slide of our AnswerLab.com homepage. And um, one of the great things that we get out of um, users' behavioral data is understanding where they go on the website, where they click, what, a what areas of the website they visit. And if users had, for example, told us that they were unable to find their desired information, we might look at this kind of d resulting data and say, well, that's because the information they told us they wanted was really contained here within case studies. And we can see from the behavioral data that only 10% clicked there. So maybe we need to rethink and reorient our user experience to better meet the goal of helping our users find desired information. So the behavioral component of both the intercept and the email surveys are really important to understanding the whys and the what's going on behind the metrics that we collect. So one of the key questions that we get about conducting measurement or benchmarking is, when is the best time to test? When is the best time to gather our metrics? And there really are two key buckets. The first is before and after changes to the website. So if you are encountering one of those landmarks that we spoke about earlier, a site redesign, an IA overhaul, some changes to your nomenclature, maybe a whole new look and feel, um, that's a really great time to think about collecting measurements. And that will help you understand if those major landmarks that you've put in place have really helped to move the needle and move your user experience towards the goals and answer those business questions that we talked about very early on. The second key bucket is uh, more of a consistent or longitudinal tracking study that really helps you to understand how your users are perceiving your, your user experience, your UX, as things change in the market or with your website. So when I say things change, I mean things like technology changes, just inherent technology changes, um, or even uh, sort of more sweeping technology changes, things like the rise of tablets. Um, also changes to your competitive landscape. Again, maybe one of your competitors is really pushing the envelope with their user experience, or maybe you've encountered a new competitor. Maybe there's an emergent competitor in your landscape. Or just the fact that your users' expectations are going to change. So as users become more savvy or more accustomed to certain things, their expectations will change over time too. So having the longitudinal tracking, having these consistent measures over time can help you um, understand where, where your UX lies vis-a-vis -vis competitors, vis-a-vis -vis your users' expectations, and set or write your course for your user experience over time. The other thing that we have had a lot of experience with, with at AnswerLab is understanding what kinds of key questions we might want to ask when we're doing these benchmarking or measurement studies, and what are the metrics that result, um, what are the survey questions and thus resulting metrics that we would be looking for. So we have a set of key research questions here that have come up consistently from study to study as we do these benchmarks. And what we find are things like how has my site been performing over time? How does my performance, uh, my UX performance compare to other sites' UX performance, whether that's competitive set, or maybe my company has multiple brands, so we want to check across the brands within my company. We get a lot of questions about who's actually visiting my site. And this is particularly important, as we'll talk about when we talk through some best practices, because understanding your target audience is very important. 
Um, we also get questions about visitors' impressions of the site, the tasks that they're trying to accomplish, their reasons for site visits, understanding if my visitors would recommend my site to other, other people, other friends or colleagues. Would they be likely to return to my site if that's what we're trying to do? If we're trying to drive repeat visits, would they be likely to come back? Um, or conversely, if, our, if my site is really intended to spur users on to take action, to do something else, to buy a product, to talk to somebody about the product. Is, it, is my site achieving that? And what we found are some key metrics that really help gauge these things either over time or across a landmark like a site redesign. So these metrics are, as you see here, um, satisfaction, ease of use, ratings on a scale, um, problems and frustrations, understanding what kinds of issues the users are running into, of course, demographics, getting demographic information and some descriptive information about users is really important to understanding the target for the website. Overall opinions, key brand statements. Um, a lot of the, the clients that we work with have key brand um, statements or um, key attributes of their brand that we can gauge how users are responding based on their visits to the website. Um, their site visit intent, why, why are you here? What is, it here? what is it that you're here to accomplish? Net promoter score, which is a great metric to track over time. And then, of course, their likelihood to return or their likelihood to take a next step. And these are sort of a set of our tried and true metrics that we use um, for tracking over time or tracking before and after, pre-post after a, um, a landmark like a site redesign to help us understand how effective the website user experience is. And again, these are, um, in, in the best case scenario, coupled with the user's behavioral information so that we can understand what's going on behind changes in these metrics. So I want to share one last slide before we start talking about the case studies. And this is our, our slide of best practices. And we have a set here to talk through. And the first um, ties back to something we were just talking about, which is the target audience. And with any research, we really feel like this is the, the first step to success. This is the first stepping off point to make sure that whatever we do, whatever we're trying to measure is successful. And, and figuring out who we want to talk to, who you want to participate in the research, um, helps determine the method that you're going to use as well. So if we do want to talk to actual site traffic, actual visitors, then we're going to, to start thinking about an intercept methodology. Um, if we know that we want to do a, um, an email survey, then we want to identify who that target audience is so we can make sure that we go out and find the right people who meet that target profile to participate in the research. Again, this is key step number one for any research that you're going to do, but it's particularly important here as well. And one key point about why this is so important for benchmarking is if you're interested in longitudinal tracking or tracking your metrics over time, you want to make sure that you have some consistency in your sample over time so that those comparisons from Q1 to Q2 or Q2 to Q3 are valid. The next best practice is to look at your high-level business goal, which we spoke about very early in our call today. And this is going to help us determine what it is that we want to measure. What are we trying to move the needle on? What are we trying to change, or what are we trying to lift, or what are we trying to impact? What is the business goal that will mean success for our user experience? Is it customer retention? Is it repeat business? Is it high levels of brand affinity? Having these kinds of goals in, the, in mind when you're thinking about embarking on a benchmarking or a, a measurement um, exercise is going to help shape the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, it's going to help shape how we glean data from our users and the methodology that we use. The next best practice is keeping those business goals in mind, of course. Drawing that product roadmap, and that's going to determine sort of where you want your user experience to go. How does your user experience or changes in your user experience um, align with your business goals? How do you line those two things up so that if your business goal is um, customer retention, what does that mean for a change in your website? How do you determine what that website, uh, what, what that change will be in your website to help drive customer retention? 
the next best practice is to understand the landmarks that will happen along the way. Will you be embarking on a, key, on a, re, a site redesign or a key marketing campaign? Will you be um, changing your look and feel of your website? Do you foresee any changes in your user's expectations or in your competitive landscape? Is there a major technology shift coming down the pike that you can foresee or that you um, have been advised will be happening? And these are really important because they help you figure out when you're going to take your measurements. So if you know that you're going to be conducting a major site redesign, it's not a bad idea to take a measurement before the redesign occurs, and then after you've launched and stabilized, of course, your redesign website. And that's so that you can understand how you are progressing vis-a-vis -vis the business goals that you set out to achieve. So understanding when to measure is actually a, a really important point of having successful measurement or benchmarking exercise. And then finally, figuring out your points of comparison. So are you comparing against yourself before or after a landmark? Are you comparing against yourself simply over time? Are you comparing against your competitors or other brands within your company? Understanding who you're comparing yourself against will help finalize the method that will be used for their measurement or the benchmarking. So if you know that you will be comparing against a competitive set, or even within other brands within your company, you, may, uh, you, you should select a method where you can direct users to various websites without interrupting or, or um, massively impacting their user experience on your own website. So we would recommend in those cases using a quantitative email invitation panel survey versus if you were comparing to yourself over time, and it's just about longitudinal tracking of your own website, then we would recommend an intercept survey where we can, can garner feedback and potentially behavior from your true site visitors at different points in time, maybe once or twice a year, three times a year, et cetera. So moving on, we've talked about why measurement, how to measure, and now we're going to talk about what this actually looks like in practice. We've got three key case studies here from actual clients that we've worked with that look at reasons that they needed to conduct measurement or benchmarking studies and the various outcomes that came from the studies that they conducted. So you can get a sense of what are the key questions or issues that our clients are running into and then uh, what was the method recommended to address those questions or issues and finally, what were the things that they've learned. So to start, we have a global um, consumer packaged goods company, and they were in preparation for a massive site redesign or overhaul across websites around the globe. So that included North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And to help inform the major site redesign that was forthcoming across these geographies, AnswerLab recommended an initial benchmark intercept survey that captured both the quantitative and the qualitative feedback from users um, to help determine how users in all of these different markets were feeling about their experience on the website, understanding why they were coming to the website, what kind of information they were looking for, um, but also how, how they reacted to the website, how the user experience was for them. And then in addition, we recommended some ongoing tracking of key metrics, which represented a subset of the questions asked in this initial benchmark survey. And that was to understand how various site modifications that were sort of on, of more of an ongoing nature um, were impacting the site user experience. And what we found was pretty interesting. Um, again, keep in mind that this was, was in advance of and then through time around a global site overhaul. So what we found was that we were able to identify the overall strengths and weaknesses of the site content globally. So we could see how users responded to content in the various markets and then how they compared amongst those markets. So maybe perhaps users in the U.S. really responded well to one piece of content, whereas users in India could, did not re react quite as well to that particular content. Additionally, we were able to drive awareness that digital designs needed to be localized. So within the company, within the client company we were working with, we were able to 
pinpoint those differences, like I just mentioned, maybe um, users in the U.S. versus users in, the Indi in India versus users in Brazil who all felt very differently about site user experience, which, which indicated that the designs for the website really needed to address the local needs of the market. We also found in-depth details around lesser known regional concerns. So concerns about, um, in this case, the product was a product that you used on your body. So concerns about products that you use on your body might be very different here in the US, again, where the, com where the client company is based than it is, say, in, again, Brazil, for example. Um, so that kind of information needs to be conveyed on the website in a very different way. Similarly, We've done other studies like this that have revealed concerns around, of course, privacy and security of information on the web across the regions, and also um, concerns or various ways of thinking about transactions, financial information on the website across the regions. In this particular study, we also highlighted some weaknesses in the internal communications in the client company across the regions. So, what we found as we were working across these various um, markets was that the communications internally within our client company could be improved in order to share best practices, to share learnings, um, but also to compare across the markets and really ensure that the site designs work locally for every market in which the company was um, playing. And then finally, we also demonstrated the importance of the ongoing site tracking because what we were able to find was that over time, as these incremental changes were made, there were changes in the metrics. There were improvements in some of the key metrics that we were tracking. But there were also some areas that consist consistently proved problematic for users. And the only way that we could know that that was the case was by tracking these key metrics over time um, and continuing to inform the client company on how they could improve these areas to achieve the goals over time. So that's the first case study. The next case study deals with an automotive manufacturer who was, again, in this case, sort of um, about a year out from a major site redesign. And they were looking to gather information to help inform that site redesign. So Answer Lab recommended Again, a baseline benchmark intercept study, and this was um, again a, a key portion of a, a key factor in um, really getting feedback from the true users of these websites, both in this case and in the CPG company example. In this example, though, we gathered user feedback as well as user behavior, and that was really important because we wanted to dig into how these visitors responded to the site content and functionality. We also wanted to see. Um, you know, if there were any areas where they were struggling or any areas that they didn't even discover. And the behavior really helped us to do that. In addition to the baseline benchmark study, we also recommended quarterly surveys to track changes in the user feedback, identify areas for improvement, and inform the site overhaul. So this quarterly tracking component helped us to understand how incremental changes to the site were impacting the user's experience. And also, um, if there were any seasonality differences in how users were responding to the content and the functionality on the website. And what we found in conducting these benchmark and then quarterly tracking studies was um, we were able to identify the most common site use cases, why these users were coming to the website, what kind of information and content they were looking for. But also we were able to uncover holes in what the site offered that users wanted. So the site um, had a lot of content and functionality, but there were some areas that either the users felt could, built out, could be built out more or that were in existence but the users were unable to find. We also honed in on some um, key navigation issues that were making it really difficult for users to find key pieces of information. So the site had a couple of really prominent use cases, but users were struggling with finding key pieces of information that were integral to those use cases. We were able to determine this not only by looking at their feedback, but also by looking at where they went on the site by, look, by uh, examining their behavioral information. And we could see that they were going to areas of the site that did not contain the content that they were looking for. We also found elements of the site design that users really liked, that they um, found particularly pleasing. 
which helped us make recommendations to our client uh, about areas that they could carry over or retain in the pending redesign. We were able to understand how users reacted to a new, a relatively new social or community aspect of the site. This was an area where users were sharing their own experiences, and we were able to get feedback on that site area in particular, um, which was really key because this was slated to be incorporated into the redesign. And then finally, we reinforced the conceptions that our client company had about users' brand perceptions and how this site played into users' brand perceptions or furthered users' brand perceptions. And we were able to measure that as consistent over time. And our final case study deals with a pharmaceutical company who is really looking to gain a competitive advantage. They wanted to be ahead of the pack for a particular oncology website competitive set, and they wanted to stay ahead of the pack. They wanted to make sure that they were the leader in this space. So we recommended a panel-based email invitation survey of healthcare professionals. And these were professionals who were specifically focused on the treatment of cancer, since it was an oncology website. And we gathered their feedback, and in this case also their behavior, on our, clients, our client company's website, as well as websites from the competitive set. And then we retested annually to see how changes to our client's site, as well as changes to their competitor's sites, um, had an impact on their users' feedback. And also, again, to help, as I mentioned earlier, keep our client at the head of the pack, help keep our client informed of changes on their, in their competitive set that would allow our client to redesign or make changes to their own website to stay at the forefront. And what we found in conducting several years of these surveys is that we were able to confirm our client company was in the leader position. So this was really great news for our client company. But when we confirmed that in our first iteration of this study, that sets a bar. And now our client needs to maintain that position over time. So what we were also able to do was identify the most preferred elements of the competitors' websites. So what areas, what content, what functionality did users like about the competitive websites that our client could think about incorporating into their own website? So how could our client, again, stay on top of the competition? We also were able to help foresee possible weaknesses that our client's website might have had vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. And this was really important because as we saw that there were potential navigation um, delights or navigation, positive navigation experiences on other competitive websites, or as we saw that there were um, potential new emerging areas of content that our, our clients' competitors were using on their websites, we were able to report about how users felt about those experiences and then recommend how our client could incorporate similar experiences into their own website. We were able to assess our clients' annual redesigns of their site, tweaks or redesigns of their sites. They weren't always these major overhauls. Some of the annual um, changes were more, more of the sort of tweaks or small changes, um, and confirmed that those were successful changes or positive changes to the user experience. Confirmed that the users, in this case the healthcare professionals, responded well to those changes. And then finally, we gathered key insights around how to present emerging content in an area that is constantly changing. So the study of oncology, the study of cancer treatment, um, and the various emerging therapies and treatments in this area is constantly changing. And we were able to investigate how this kind of information was presented on various websites and how users responded to it and help our client come up with a strategy for presenting this information that really had a positive impact on their user experience. So that was the, the case study section. But before we wrap up, I want to reiterate the best practices that we talked about. The first one being determining your target audience so that you know who should participate in the research. Again, this is step one for a successful research study of any type, but particularly important for measurement or benchmarking. The next is to determine your high-level business goals, assess your business goals so that you can figure out what it is at a high level you're trying to measure. What are you trying to change, lift, or impact? 
The next is keeping those business goals in mind. Draw that product roadmap. Draw the map for your product, your website, to figure out how you're going to take or where you're going to take your user experience. And then also understand the landmarks on that roadmap to understand not only how you're going to change your user experience, but when you should be taking measures, when you should be going out into the market and gathering feedback, gathering the metrics. And finally, agreeing on the points of comparison, whether you're comparing it to yourself before and after a landmark, whether you're comparing it to yourself over time, to, com to your competitive set, um, to your sister or brother brands, this will help you finalize the method for your measurement or your benchmarking. So we have about 10 minutes left, and that's actually the last um, content slide of the presentation. So I want to throw the conversation back to all of you on the phone. We do have a chat window, as um, Nick mentioned at the top of the conversation. And oops, I apologize about that. I seem to have lost my screen sharing. There we go. Um, we do have a chat window available to you. Um, I unfortunately am not able to access that. So Tanya, if you are on the line and are able to see and or read me any questions, that would be incredibly helpful. Sally, I'm going to paste them over to you in the chat window so that, they're, um, so that you have them in front of you. Okay, great. Thank you. I seem to have had a technical malfunction glitch for a second. Um, so I do have one question here that I can see now, um, which is how do I account for or find out if my site visitors are changing over time? That is a great question, and actually that's where a study like we have just been talking about, these kinds of benchmarking or, or um, in particular longitudinal tracking studies come in handy. Um, having a um, intercept study where you can gauge your site traffic, understand who these users are, understand their reasons for visiting your website and their expectations for your website, as well as how they feel about your brand or your products, being able to take that measurement um, several points in time, that will help you understand if your site visitors are changing. The underlying question that I'm potentially re misreading into, but I'm going to go there, is possibly how do you determine if your site visitors' expectations are changing over time? And that's something that requires a little bit of a deeper dive into your users and possibly even some additional research, um, qualitative research where you can sit down and talk with them, in field research where you can see how they're behaving in their life um, outside of the sort of outside of the lab. Um, and, and that can give you some inter some interesting information about how their expectations are changing, how their habits and behaviors, et cetera, are changing. So we have a question here. Um, that is in the second case study that we mentioned, which was the automotive manufacturer case study, we talked about users' reactions to a social community aspect that we were able to get feedback on. And the question is, can we, tell, can we talk a little bit more about this? Was the community actually implemented before the user reactions were obtained? Did we test a rough prototype first? There are a lot of questions here. <laughs> what is the best way to go about gauging reactions to something like this? So I'm going to chunk that up. Um, in this case, the community aspect was already implemented. It was fully functional on the live website. So we were getting users' reactions, real-time users' reactions. These were actual site visitors because it was an intercept study. Um, we were able to get their reactions to that particular area of the site. Um, did you test a rough prototype first? I was not involved personally in testing a rough prototype before this area went live. However, it's always a great idea to do so. It helps you to understand um, pretty, pretty early in the process how users would react to that type of content. Um, and it helps. We always like to advocate to test things 
as early as possible because once you go through the process of implementing um, new features, new functionality, new content, and you've gone through the whole process of designing and, and developing and coding everything, you've already invested a lot of resources, time, and money. And if users aren't going to react positively to it or they're not going to understand how to use it or they're going to, going to struggle with it, you've already sunk the resources, time, and money. So if you're able to test it early enough, get users' feedback, tweak, potentially get more feedback, and make sure that it's optimized for your target user group, it oftentimes in the long run saves those resources. So testing a prototype is something we would always recommend to do early if you are able. Um, and then there's the last question, which is, what is the best way to go about gauging reactions to something like this? So something like the community aspect. And that really depends. Um, you can gauge overall reactions with some simple questions about how users felt about that area of the site. Um, in a quantitative setting, you might ask, ask something as simple as satisfaction, which is a great metric to be able to track over time. But more pointedly, you might ask if they would recommend somebody else like them to utilize that area of the site. Because if, it's, if this area is geared towards community or social interaction, you might want to understand if that's something that they would want their friends or family or colleagues or potential um, other automotive shoppers to be involved in. So there are several different questions that you could ask to gauge reactions to a social or community aspect of a website. You could also, um, one last point, you could also ask how valuable they found it and then follow up with a question about what was or wasn't valuable. It all depends on the point of that community or social aspect of the site. Are you looking to provide value? Are you looking to provide sort of the, the warm and fuzzy feeling of being part of a community? What are you really getting at with that area? And then determining the question or metric from there. Um, we have a question here, which is, how do you intercept folks? How does that work? So basically about the mechanics of an intercept. That's a great question. Um, our intercepts, that um, the typical type of intercept that we use, are based in JavaScript code that gets placed, a very small snippet, in fact, of JavaScript code that gets placed on the pages where we want, page or pages where we want to intercept users. So in many cases, it's the home page of the website. Maybe if there are other pages that users typically land on, we would place the code there as well. And that code triggers um, upon page load with a, a page load plus a, a slight margin, so maybe 5, 10, or 15 seconds after the page is fully loaded, it triggers a layer to appear on the user's screen. And it's important to note that this is a layer, a JavaScript layer, and not an actual window. And that's key because the windows are often blocked by pop-up blockers, whereas the layer appears, just as described, as a layer on the user's web browser window. So it's not blocked by pop-up blockers. And that screen, that layer, I shouldn't call it a screen. It's not actually a, a different window. Again, that layer includes an invitation for the user to participate in the research, in the study. Um, if there is an incentive offered, we usually mention that there is some sort of incentive, which is typically of the sweepstakes variety. Um, and we ask the user to opt in. So all of these studies are opt-in studies, which is really important. The user does have to obviously agree to participate. Um, and then the other key to an intercept survey is, again, depending upon the type of um, site traffic that you have on your website, depending on your target user audience, and also depending upon the type of incentive you might be offering, we always like to keep intercept studies as short as we possibly can while still getting the best and most important information out of the users. And the reason for that is we are asking users to participate in the research while they're having their site experience. So we want to keep it as unobtrusive as possible, but make sure that we hone in on those key metrics, and those key pieces of information that are going to get our clients the insights and the strategic direction that they need for their website. So I don't see any more questions unless you have some, Tanya. Um, but for those of you on the phone, if you have additional questions, if you think of questions after this conversation, oh, I do see one more coming in, but I'll finish my thought quickly. If you have any um, additional questions, if you think of any questions that come in, uh, that come to you after this phone call, please feel free to uh, contact the, the email address that you see on the screen right now, which is info at answerlab.com. 
And the last question that I have here is, when is behavioral tracking most beneficial? This is a really great question because there are a lot of surveys out there that ask users about their satisfaction with the site, their likelihood to return or recommend the site. And having those metrics over time is really a great, very high level, sometimes out of context, set of information to help drive the user experience of the site. The behavioral tracking is particularly beneficial when it's hard to understand what's going on with those metrics, which can be often. Um, you know, we think behavioral uh, tracking is beneficial a lot of the time because it helps provide a lot of the context that you would get in a lab setting, but outside of the lab setting, and allowing users to interact in their natural environment. So the behavioral tracking is beneficial whenever we're wanting to get a little bit deeper, a little bit more context around what's going on with the metrics. All right, so that seems to be it for our questions today. Um, if you do, again, if you do have any additional questions, if you want to um, chat a little bit more about some of these things, please feel free to email info at answerlab.com, and we'll make sure that we address them. Thank you again for joining um, the call today. We really appreciate it.